Welcome to another edition of the Believer's Breed podcast, where it's all about self-awareness, self-confidence, and self-worth. We sit down with people who are accomplishing their goals. They've overcome obstacles because they believe. And today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Jose Hustle himself, Rasheed Walker, uh, CEO of the Nashville Pro-Am. It's nice to have you here. Man, man. thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. For sure. Um, So for those that don't know Mr. Rasheed Walker, tell us who you are, man. Uh, I'm Rasheed Walker. Like he said, I'm the executive chairman of the Nashville Pro-Am Basketball League the executive chairman of Hustle Strong Foundation, and I am the director of sales for 632 Customs. Uh, but more importantly, I'm a community philanthropist. Uh, I love doing things in the community for the youth and for under, you know, underprivileged people. Um, you know, I'm a hustler, that's, you know, key. But, you know, on the, in the business sense, and also I'm a go-getter, and I'm a strong believer in myself. You know, it's, you know, fitting that I'm on the Believers Breed podcast because mm-hmm. Everything I do, I have self, strong self-belief in myself before I do anything. If I, can't, if I don't see myself already accomplishing it or doing it, it's no even me, to, me even trying. So, so uh, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Now, obviously, we see you with the Nashville Pro-Am. We see you with the Hustle Strong Foundation. We see you with 622 Customs. But can you tell us where this started? Where did the entrepreneurial journey begin? How did you get into it? Um, take us through like the beginning, the foundation. Uh, it started at a very young age. I have an uncle. He owns, he founded and owns the Universal Circus. Okay. And that kicked off in 1994. But prior to that, he started the very first rap concert tour called the Fresh Festival. And that was in 1983. Worked along with, you know, Run DMC, you know, with Russell Simmons and the Beastie Boys, Fat Boys, Heavy D, Houdini and stuff like that. So. Uh, it all kind of started in the family, just seeing, you know, my uncle and my aunt do their thing, you know, not only with the circus and the concerts, but with tours. You know, I've always just been one to start, like, want to do something of my own. And whether it was me, you know, selling candy in high mm-hmm. school or selling, you know, CDs and DVDs in high school and college, I was always just wanted to create my own narrative and build my own future. So that's why I, that's what kind of how I got influenced into being an entrepreneur through my family. Now, when, with you seeing your uncle doing so much and you starting to sell candy and, you know, even at a young age, really having that entrepreneurial spirit. Did you have any guidance from your uncle? Did anybody kind of, you know, steer you in the right direction? Oh, with- yeah. Uh, he would give me tips and pointers, mm-hmm. you know, like price, you know, price like this. or this how you attract more people or, you know, do it like that. So. Uh, he would definitely, he wouldn't tell me how to do it because it was me doing it, but he would give me pointers and that would make a big difference, mm-hmm. you know, so that always helped. And I had brothers, uh, well not had, but I have brothers that, you know, one is a barber, uh, one is, you know, he's a logistics expert, but he, he worked for a flour bread company. So it was more so of just taking different tactics and strategies and ideas from them and implementing it in my own program. Now, do you think everybody has that in them, or is there only a certain group of people that... I think everybody has it. It's just they got to tap into it. They got to figure out what it is that they will want to do, or it takes a certain person to uh, bring it out of them. Mm-hmm. Or it takes, you know, something that would just trigger it for it to kick in gear. But everybody has it. It's just that everybody everybody may not be interested in tapping into it, but it's in there. It's, everybody has that that drive, that spirit in them. So this question may be a little off the radar, but as a kid and starting your journey so early, how was the formal education system for you? Because they don't really teach entrepreneurship in schools. So with you already selling candy, you seeing your uncle, you know, doing business and going to get it on his own, not really using that formal education per se, like, was it hard for you to sit in the classroom and, and really be focused on something when you're like, I mean, I know what I want to do. What did, what did that look like for you? Uh, well, it, was, it wasn't hard for me to sit in the classroom because I knew education come first. Mm-hmm. If I don't get my education because, you know, I won't be able to do what I need to do or want to do. Uh, I still take, you know, it still may not, it may not be the content that you learn in the classroom, but how you learn it, the situations that come across that you will still be applicable in today's, you know, lifestyle. Mm. And so I feel like, you know, coming up, my education was good. I, compared to what they're teaching in schools now, 
-hmm. to when I was coming out, you know, it's a big difference because they have centered focus, you know, classes for it, like economics and business and, you know, personal finance. You know, I, I had a great, you know, high school and middle school education, but I would love to trade it for what they're teaching kids now because they're getting a, a five, six year step ahead of where mm -hmm. I was at, but coming out. So I was blessed to have, you know, family members that were into business already. So I learned what I needed to learn in school, but I also got, you know, extra learning from just being around and seeing it. Mm -hmm. Now, what from, I mean, I could be wrong about this, but I think for something as big as the Nashville Pro-Am, you're relatively young to be the hands behind this, you know? <laughs> and so, you, as somebody so young, what has that journey been like for you to be involved with corporations and going to get sponsorships and reaching out to the NBA league office and getting players to come in? Being so young, do you have a lot of challenges that you face, a lot of red oh, tape? Oh, yeah. Uh, I first got, so the Nashville Pro-Am, we played our inaugural game in 2015 on my actual birthday, June 22nd. So that was like big and special to me. I, you know, it, it was perfect. But, you know, leading into it the year before in 2014, you know, I decided I, this is what I want to do. I'm going to try my hand at it. It was, if I can think, I think it was game three of the NBA finals. It was the Spurs and Heat. I had a little watch party going on. And during like a timeout or halftime, I say, hey, man, I'm going to bring the Pro-Am back. I just told the people that was, you know, there, I said, I'm going to bring the Pro-Am back. Probably do it next year. They were like, oh, okay, all right. So I, I just took that as a challenge. <laughs> so um, being young, getting people to take you serious, that was a hurdle. Um, and then, you know, like the organization, building, like being organized wasn't hard for me because that's how I live my life. I, I'm very structured, very organized. But it was more so of getting others on board you know, convincing players to, you know, be a part of it. Then, you know, get coaches and then get people that would be a sponsor or put money into it. So to start out, it was very difficult. I had the framework, but I didn't have the people. Mm -hmm. Then once I convinced the people to get on board, everything slowly started to fall in place. Um, and then, you know, speaking with the NCAA and then speaking with, you know, the NBA and then speaking with NBA players and, uh, it really just boiled down to just being a people person and utilizing your network. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult to start out. I bet. Now, you said something really profound, and I'm not going to let you breeze past it. So you said you had the framework, but you mm -hmm. didn't have the people. And I think so many people that are starting off as entrepreneurs or have goals or ambitions, they have that framework, mm -hmm. but they may not have the team of people to help them get it done. So what would you say to that person? How do you go out and find those type of people that can help you make those dreams come true? I would say get like-minded people. Get people who is almost a carbon copy of you or share, this, share the same viewpoints or share the same ideologies or share the same hustle as you got. Like that would be interested in doing what you would do. You know, I you know, created a basketball league and the staff that I have is phenomenal. We all have a sports background. We all have, you know, a strong drive of being community, you know, involved as well. So it just made sense. So having a framework, but then you having a basketball operate director of basketball operations, a CFO, then a you know a operations you know director, and then myself, the executive chairman, and then you have, you know, other other small pieces to the puzzle. They're important. Because without the small pieces, the big pieces don't matter. That's right. Um, you know, so the key, the key thing is just getting the right people in place and letting them do their thing. You know, I'm not big on micromanaging. You know, I, what I like to do, I just like to put it out there, say this is what I need done. I'm going to trust you in doing it. And once I see it not being done at a timely manner or being done the way I would like it, then I'll intervene. But other than that, I'm going to let you do your thing because we all have the same goal in mind. And I don't want you to feel like you're being hovered over. I want you to be, you know, be in your element while we're accomplishing the common goal. That's good, man. So those people that you brought on board, are they able to see where you want to take this league? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they you know, see where we want to take the league and the foundation. It's, they see it. And that's mm -hmm. why, I, you know, it's great to have the team that I have because we all are striving. We're all pushing each other. We're all elevating. We're all look, thinking next level and not right now. 
That word hustle, I hear you say it a lot. Um, and even at the beginning of this podcast, I mentioned that one of your nicknames is Jose Hustle. Right. What does that word mean to you? Because it's a word that's kind of thrown around freely in today's culture, but you seem to have a really strong relationship with that word. What does that word mean oh, man, to you? Man, it means everything to me because I have my own acronym for it. I'm going to get into that shortly. But, um, I mean, you're just making it happen. You're going to get it. You're going to go do it. Like, think about in sports. You know, he's, he, he hustles in and every play. He hustles. He hustles to get the ball. He hustles on defense. It's always constant movement, constant making it happen, just the accelerated effort. And for me, hustle means how you survive through life every day. Mm. You know, because everybody hustles. Mm -hmm. What you do to get through the day and what I do to get through the day is different, but you're putting forth your best ability, which mm -hmm. is strong. So that's what hustle strong tie into. Mm -hmm. So hustle, how you, how you survive through life every day. You know, you may have a person that is the CEO of a company. Then you may have a person that is a janitor. Or you may have a person that's a basketball player and you got a teacher. You know, the teacher got to do her job to get the education and information to the students so they can get the grades so she can keep her job. Mm -hmm. You know, so she, they can meet the scores. She hustling. Mm -hmm. She's hustling. It's a, everybody has a different method. Mm -hmm. The athlete got to train in the offseason. He got to hustle. got to put in the work. So when the season start, he can continue to play well and, get, and earn a new contract to support himself and his family. It's a hustle. Everybody, mm -hmm. everything in life to me, mm -hmm. it's a hustle into it because if you just, you know, drag your feet or take it, you know, slow, you're not going to get much done and you'll get really worked around if you're not hustling. That's good, man. That's good. Now, for those who may not know exactly what that hustle is for them, and in their head, it's like, I'm unsatisfied with this, but I don't know exactly what I want to be doing. I have this passion, but I don't know exactly how to make it manifest. Like, what do you say to that person? Uh, sit down, write out the things that you love doing. And then out of the things you, out of the things that you love doing, is there a possibility for you to make money? Not putting, not saying everything is about profit, but without money, it's not. It's very few things you can do in this world. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Write out the things you would like doing, and then, then by process of elimination, see, is this? You know, can I make this a career? Could mm -hmm. I? Could I do this every day and then not feel like work? Mm -hmm. Could I love? Could I love to do this? Some stuff you would want to create. Some stuff there is a lane for you. Like there's a career path for you. Mm -hmm. So I think you know every everybody has genius level talent. Or mm -hmm. has genius level, you know, drive. They got to find it. They got to figure out what it is. They can do effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Like they can close their eyes and do it and it'd be perfect. Make it happen. Yeah. Everybody has that in them. They just got to figure it out. With me, it's a multitude of things. But, you know, I've, it's just a matter of finding it and just attacking it and just maximizing it. You're not going to get rich overnight. But you put in the work, it comes quicker than you know. Mm. So... Obviously, you have the Nashville Pro-Am, which we'll get back to, but you also have the Hustle Strong Foundation. You have 622 Customs. Talk about how you started with the Pro-Am, but now you're starting to build on the things that you love to do. It seems like you have this, this unbridled passion for sports, and with that passion, you've started to create other avenues for you to really chase that. Oh, what did yeah. that look like? Uh, well... Hustle Strong Foundation came, it was, it came into concept in 2010 while I was still in college. Um, you know, I always was big on giving back. Like, I've been doing community service at the National Rescue Mission since I was in 11th grade. That was like 06. So I've always, you know, gave back. I wanted to always do things in the community to help others. And so um, in 2017, I really took the steps forward and got it, you know, got, made it official, a nonprofit organization to where I can do things and get help from other people to do it as well in the community. And you know, whether it's, you know, giving uniforms to, for AAU teams or, you know, giving them, you know, helping them financially with travel expenses or doing a shoe drive and dropping it off at local community centers for the youth or, you know, giving clothes to different high school students and stuff like that. It's just, I'm, I pride myself on being a community philanthropist by just helping as many people as I can because 
you know, I've been blessed to, you know, live the life that I've lived, you know, so far and people have helped me. So I want to help others and give back to as many people as I can in, the, in a positive light. And um, so that's been a big passion of mine, even on like when I travel for holidays, um, like I go to a lot of Dallas Cowboys games on Christmas. I partner with the Salvation Army mm. and to, to go on Christmas Day to go give, you know, for people that come to get p food and stuff, serve plates to them or, you know, on Thanksgiving, I go, you know, help prepare food at the Nazareth Rescue Mission or wherever city I'm at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've just always had a passion of helping, mm -hmm. of being a blessing to others, being, you know, help to other people. And, uh, and it's shifted into sports as well by doing it in a, you know, in a community aspect and in a sports and youth aspect as well. So that's what Hustle Strong Foundation plays into with one of my passions. And with 622 Customs, uh, I love jerseys. <laughs> you know, I've been wearing jerseys since I've been born. I see it on your, uh, your Instagram page. You know, I got, <laughs> I have pictures of wearing jerseys forever. So, you know, and I always pride myself on having one of one exclusive exclusive stuff <laughs> and so i would get jerseys made and then people would ask me hey man where you get that made at or who made that or who did that and so i'm like man you know what why not turn this into something mm -hmm. and you know the 622 that is my birth date mm -hmm. you know so that's where it that's where the number comes in with customs so uh i just turned a passion of mine and turn it a little bit into profit. Mm -hmm. I love jerseys. I love wearing them. I, you know, and I take and I get proud out of making the jerseys because it's a special. Like I, I, I've done so many jerseys for a lot of people, like the high school jerseys or somebody that's passed away or you know something to represent their child or or something to represent their favorite player or a rare moment in sports. It, it's not about the money with me. It's about that I can bring special moments mm. back to them. Mm. You know, like, oh, this is my son's middle school jersey. I'm going to wear it to his game to know his dad is his number one fan. Mm. Or this is, you know, this is one of my homeboys from high school. He got killed, and I want to, you know, I want to live on his legacy by wearing mm. his jersey. So um, that is special to me, knowing that I can help bring them, you know, nostalgic memories to mm. life and something that they can, you know, look at and materialize, bring back memories and stuff that might have been lost. And so, you know, I love jerseys and I love making people feel good. So that's kind of like the win-win on my that's end. That's cool. What What's the coolest jersey you've been able to create thus far? Oh, man, that's, it's, it's like three. Lou Williams, Lou Williams High School jersey, South Gwinnett. Six man, Mr. Yeah. Six man. It was actually for his cousin um, and, and Lou, Lou had uh, saw it, and he was he was like really surprised. <laughs> he liked it a lot. Oh, uh, let me see. What's another cool one? I think I've I've done a lot of Glencliff jerseys. Mm. I think I think that's just cool in itself, because so many people from that school are you know are going back in time mm -hmm. and and redoing it. Uh, and I think uh, the cool the maybe this might take the cake. Um, Master P Charlotte mm -hmm. Hornets jersey. Mm -hmm. Uh, like that, he broke a lot of barriers with that. A lot of people don't even know he played basketball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the masterpiece Charlotte Hornets. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that might be the coolest. That might be the coolest I've made because it's it's attaching two cultures in one: mm -hmm. the hip hop culture and the actual basketball culture. And he did both. Right. You know, he didn't play full season, but just to play he on the it. team, yeah. he did it. Yeah, that's cool stuff, man. Now, when talking about the foundation, you mentioned really wanting to pour back and help people because people helped you. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we have this crab mentality right now that we often see, and it prevents us from really having the growth that we should. Why do you think it's that way? And where do you see we could go if we were to pour back into communities? I think people are afraid. They don't trust in their own ability. They don't trust in their own hustle. They don't trust in their own, you know, their own program or their mojo. Because I can tell, I can give you, you can ask me, how did I do this? Or who, where did I get, or you can ask me whatever. I'm going to tell you where to go get it and who to talk to. You're not me. So I'm not worried about you taking my spot. Mm. 
I have my own mojo. I have my own touch on things. I have my own energy to it. And the thing, that's why I think people, they don't want to help because they think, oh, he going to take my spot. Or he going to da 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 Or she's going to outdo me. Or, you know, listen, what's for you is for you. Mm-hmm. God has already ordained what is going to be in your life that nothing and nobody can fade. So I don't have a problem with helping people because I know, and this is not a, a non-compete type thing. I don't compete with nobody. But, you know, I'm a, I, I don't mind helping because somebody helped me. And who am I to withhold information that could help somebody? That's good. You know, but I'm not worried about what next person do because you can't do what I do. Mm. I can't do what you do because God has put it in you to do your thing. I can't do Jeremy's thing. Mm-hmm. I only can do me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I always will help. My, my phone number is public. My email is public. Call me or text me or whatever. And I'm going to give you the best answer I can in regards to, you know, whatever it is. Because I know you, you know, you have your own reach and touch on stuff. I have my own touch. Running your lane, I run in mine. We're not going to cross paths because what's for you is for you. Right. That's good, man. Now, with the Nashville program, I'm sure there are some uh, very high profile conversations that you have to have and high profile emails. Take us through that cycle of how you're able to really cut on that that professional demeanor when dealing with people that have to make decisions that could impact you. Now, I know you are who you are, but I think sometimes people get trapped behind where I'm just going to be who I am and you know, whatever room I walk in, uh, like, yeah. is that you got to understand you have to like but, but what they say in basketball. You got to know your personnel. Mm-hmm. You got to know what you're walking in. You got to know who you're about to guard. You about to know who's going to be guarding you, who's you about to check. So before you walk into that room or take that meeting, you got to know what type of person you're, you know, you're meeting with or dealing with or, you know, what background they have, what's their interest, what's their, you know, what are they looking to looking to hear? Not always saying tell them what they want to hear, but, you know, you just got to have a, a understanding. You can't just be you all the time because that's not quite, and it sounds contradicting, but it's, it's levels of you mm-hmm. that you can, you know, display. Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm hanging with you or hanging with my homeboys or hanging with, you know, people from college, you know, I'm going to just do, I'm going to just relax. I'm going to just, you know, shoot the breeze. You know, when I'm, when I'm maybe, I, you know, run into a, potential sponsor somewhere or a current sponsor, I'm not going to be as free flowing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just all about, or, you know, when I, when I talk with the NBA or when I meet with the NBA, it's straight to business. It's, you know, this is who I am and this is what programs that we have in motion, but we're going to talk, we're going to get straight to the bottom line and get it handled, get it situated. We may talk a little bit off topic, but nothing too, you know, nothing too, um, fancy. And, uh, you know, whether it's approaching players, you know, a lot of players that play I've had a relationship with or I know somebody that has a relationship with, but I approach them as if I don't know them. Mm. You know, you're not going to just walk up like, hey, man, come hoop, bro. Mm-hmm. Hoop, hoop. Mm-hmm. Look, how are you doing? My name is Rashid Walk. I'm the executive chairman of Nashville pro You know, we, you know, we do da 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 We have such and such players play. I will talk with you, you know, see if it's a possibility would you come play this summer or in the coming years, and, you know, and take it from there. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody wants to be approached with respect and dignity, so I want to give that. Um, but I think it just got to, it has to be a switch you can cut on and off. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody doesn't need to get Jose Hustle. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody doesn't need to get the at-home Rashid Walker. Mm-hmm. It just, you got that, you got, it's time and place for everything. Right. Now, I'm sure through this process, from the beginning even to now, you've heard a lot of no's. And oh, yeah. people don't necessarily know what those no's have been, but you do. How do you deal with people telling you no, whether it's players, whether it's the NBA, whether it's the NCAA, whether it's somebody with, you know, dealing with 622 customs? How do you deal with no? Keep going. That ain't gonna stop nothing. Mm-hmm. Keep going. Oh, you told me no, all right, hey, what about you? Mm-hmm. You see, like, uh, you would be surprised of how many NBA players I I was at All-Star Weekend this year, 
all of, uh, almost a lot of NBA players was there. I mean, not almost a lot, but almost all of them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, after the game, you know, I was blessed with the opportunity to hang around and be with the mix of the players. And I talked with a lot of players that I'm not going to mention, but a lot of them told me no. Some of them told me, no, nah, I, I don't hoop into something. I'm good. <laughs> Some said, oh, yeah, I might. I'll give, give me your card. I'll get back with you. You know, I, you're not, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had several responses told me no. I'm not. We're good on this. Actually, two this week told me no. All right, th let's keep it moving. Keep going. Like, in life, it shouldn't stop. It should drive you to what I do. It makes me push my work ethic to a higher level to where you see what I'm doing. You're going to want to be a part of it mm. the next go around. You're going to regret saying no in 2019 because when 2020 comes, it may not be available or the price may be mm -hmm. high. <laughs> you know, or, you know, it, you're going to be like, man, I should have got on board and did that. Or I should have partnered with him or I should have brought him. I should have did the interview or I should have whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I just take no and use it as a driving force to turn it into yeses in the future. That's good. Or just the driving force to do it even bigger or why, you know, I should prove myself even more. Got you. Now, before we wrap up, um, give me some names of some players that would be like dream come true, bucket list type event for them to come and play in the Nashville Pro-Am. Uh, LeBron James. I actually sent him a message on Instagram this week. <laughs> I sent him a message. LeBron, him, if you hear this, I told him come hoop. <laughs> come hoop. Straight like I mean, it was it was well a well you know structured message. Uh -huh. But told him come hoop. You know what we need to do to make this happen. Come on, I'm gonna make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, James Harden. Mm -hmm. uh, Trey Young. Let me see who else. Lou Williams. Lou. Um, Michael Jordan. He's retired, so I don't think he would play no more. <laughs> Kobe, he's in shape, but I don't think he would play. Uh, I think those are like, um, you know, uh, Joel Embiid, that would be mm. big. Ben Simmons, Kimball Walker, uh, DeMar DeRozan. Mm. I'm trying to think who else. Like guys that actually be hooping in the summer. Mm -hmm. Kyrie Irving, that would be mm. nice to have him come play. Montrez Harrell. Well, Kyrie, you can send Uncle Drew if you want to. Yeah, I don't <laughs> care which, which persona you send, just come. <laughs> You know, it's a lot of guys like it pretty much like a, with me, any NBA player is a dream. Uh, it's a dream come true. If an uh, NBA player wants to come play, it's a dream. Whether you're the sixth man, 12th man, or the superstar. Mm -hmm. Because that was my dream to get, you know, to build a league to where college guys overseas and NBA players come play. And we're not in a non-NBA city. I mean, we are in a non-NBA city, so for guys to come to a non-NBA city and hoop, that's big. big yeah. That's big to me because, mm -hmm. you know, it hasn't, it has been done, but it hasn't been done before on the level that I'm doing it in Nashville right now. And so, you know, salute to the 10 NBA guys that's played so far, you know, in the five years of the league. We're going to try to double that number this summer and take it up another level, you know, uh, and just continue to grow. But it's been a dream. Like any NBA player, those were the, like, top guys, but mm -hmm. any NBA player is a dream come true because I'm not an NBA player. I didn't make it to the NBA, but NBA players come play with me. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's big on my end that I like, you know, that I pride myself on, that I, you know, tip my hat to. That's huge. Now, some people, when given the opportunities like you have, become starstruck or start clout chasing. What type of demeanor are you looking to have around these players where most people are running for autographs or trying to get pictures? Not that it's necessarily anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but at times it can be over the top. And you as somebody that is sitting in the front office of the Nashville Pro-Am, you know, you can't be that way when right. you see these players. So, um, like All-Star Weekend, man, I, I say this, man, if I had another set of eyes or a camera that could record you know, who I'm rubbing up against, not, you know, rubbing shoulders with, talking with, kept running into, you would see like, dang, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Man, he's with him. Like, I ran into LeBron after the game. I was sitting and eating lunch with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Isaiah Thomas like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't be a fan at that point. Mm -hmm. But um, back to your question, 
I was blessed with the opportunity to have a cousin that played in the NFL for 10 years named Frank Walker. He got drafted in 03. So that was my ninth grade year of high school. So um, I got I got to be a fan young. Mm -hmm. I got to meet Ray Lewis and, you know, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning and, you know, all of the NFL superstars. Like, not just the ones he played with, but other friends that he was, you know, teammates with. Mm -hmm. And so I got to be a fan young. I got that out the way. And so when it was time to do business, when it's time to cut on being business, mm. it was like, uh, he's, that's another guy. Yeah. You just like me. You just got a mo couple more million than I do. <laughs> you know, uh, so, but that also taught me by growing up around my uncle, growing up around my cousin, they taught me how to maneuver and operate around you know, dignitaries or important people or celebrities or stars and stuff like that. So that's why I kind of like, I'm not going to lie. It may be a time. Like if I was to see Michael Jordan, I'm clicking over into fan mode. <laughs> but um, that may be the only person. Like I've mm -hmm. seen all of the, st like all the actors, all the stars. But, you know, I know where I want to get to. Like I, one thing I, one of them told me when you act, when you treat us like when you treat us normal, you know, we, we don't mind being around you, but as soon as you start wanting to take pictures and autographs and fans, mm -hmm. I try to shy away from it because everybody on planet Earth is looking for the same thing. It's right. rare when they meet somebody that's not on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with me with the clout chasing type thing, um, I know it all can be taken away from you in a blink of an eye, which I've, you know, nearly experienced. So just being myself and being humble and being true to who I am that's just been the biggest thing for me because I was in a car accident in March 2016. Uh, you know, I almost lost my life and it was almost over with. And, you know, not to say uh, that made me put a lot of different things in perspective because I always, you know, had it, but it just enlarged it. Mm. You know, having to start from the, you know, I lost almost everything, but just with my faith in God and my faith in myself, you know, I was able to get back on track and even higher than where I was. And, you know, to, to be to walk around with your chest out all the time at any given moment, anything can happen. Right. Like a, a famous saying that I heard from a mobster, you know, two things, three things can happen. You can wake up, walk outside, get hit by a bus and die. You can wake up, hit the lottery and be rich and later die. Or you can wake up, walk outside hit the lottery, and then get hit by a car and die. Hmm. It, it, at any given moment, it can all change mm -hmm. no matter what is going on. So it just keeps me grounded, and it just keeps me, you know, uh, thankful for everything that's happening good in my life, you know, whether it's from my work ethic or just good timing. Mm -hmm. Man, it's a, a huge blessing to be able to even have this conversation. As I look back at pictures and see, you know, how you looked, how the car looked. Oh, yeah. It's it's phenomenal, man. man it's, you know, it's all God's grace, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just all because he, he had told me a while back, like, it just wasn't your time. It wasn't your time to leave this earth yet. It's a lot more I want to do with you. So just just, you know, just be patient and just follow my lead. And that's what I believe. And that's mm -hmm. what I stuck with, you know. Because it, it was a 20% chance of me making it through those injuries. Wow. So that's 80% going against the grain. 20% chance. So I'll thank God and the great doctors and staff at Vanderbilt Medical Center for, you know, putting it, you know, putting me back together, you know, putting in the work. And, you know, I'm here still able to, you know, do what I want to do and do what he wants me to do. Because, uh, I mean, it was a long journey. Mm -hmm. But main thing, I always, I had belief. Like, they told me it was going to be 24 months to recover. That's two years. I said, okay. I knew in my mind I wanted to be back healthy to start the 2016 Pro-Am. Mm. You know, that kicked off, uh, I can't remember the date, the exact date that was, maybe June 24th or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 because my birthday was on a Thursday that year. So, that, yeah, June 24th was opening night for that season. The accident was March 26th. I had uh, two months to get healthy enough to run my business. From being, like, from being on life support having nine surgeries, having to learn how to walk again, having to do rehab, having to get sold up and all that type stuff. I was determined. Like I just believed that I'm going to bounce back from this. It wasn't nothing. You know, if I made it through the in if I made it through the injuries, I'd make it through anything. Mm. It was just a belief I had in myself. And uh, 
That's why I feel like nothing and nobody can fade nothing. whatever I want to do. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been, trust me, been I've, at the I've been at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. I've seen the worst. <laughs> so it can't get worse than that. Mm -hmm. And if it is, I don't want to experience it. Right. You know, so it's just my belief. Like, people thought I was delusional, thought I was crazy. I'm like, man, I'll be back. I'll be walking by June. Trust me. <laughs> So I had shattered my ankle. I had a lot of internal organ injuries, you know, that was threatening. Had internal brain bleeding, broke my face, had like two rounds of plastic surgery, broke my collarbone, uh, lost a lot of weight, but I was still the same person mm -hmm. inside. I just, appearance and physical, it wasn't the same, but I still had strong belief that, man, I'll be back. I, you know, I'll be back way sooner than expected. And it did, and it happened. It was just, you know, it was just what I, my whole thought process behind everything. Wow. So for the one question that a lot of entrepreneurs want to know about everybody who has accomplished something is going to be about money. And obviously putting together the program, uh, the other businesses that you have, talk about the foundation of finances and how can people fund their dreams? Be ready to take a loss. Mm. Planning is one. Planning, like I said, in 2014, I come up with the idea. 2015, I did it. Mm. It took me a whole year to plan for it, to understand what's this going to cost? What's that going to cost? How much can I do that for? You know, I understood what I'm going to be working with. You can't just up it. You can. But I would suggest you just up and do it. You got a plan. I call it financial forecasting. Hmm. Planning of what you want to do. So take a whole year or however much you want to do or however much you know you need, how much this is going to cost. Or how much that's like to be to run it exactly how you want to run it. You need to know what the number you're shooting at. Then you can save towards it or you can go get a loan or you can, you know, work up however you want to work up to get the finances. But and also in that first year, be prepared to lose. I don't know if people can deal with that, though. Can they yeah. deal with that? I think they can. It's just that <laughs> I don't think they want to. Be prepared to lose. Like, I, I took a, the first two years of the pro-am, I lost. But that was okay because it was my dream. Mm -hmm. I did something nobody else has done. I did something I wanted to do. I believed in myself that it's going to turn profitable, you know, for the, for the foundation soon enough mm -hmm. you know um so i just you know just put it out put it out put it out and it'll all come like i don't think you can find one entrepreneur that didn't lose in this first year you may find a couple but they may, they were trust fund babies mm -hmm. you know that they're, they're lost in their first couple years of operating but it's gonna if it's something you really want to do it'll pay itself off it'll mm -hmm. pay its own dividends back That's give good. it time and give it work and effort and all that stuff um, but yeah, just plan. Take time out. Plan it out before you do it. Nothing good comes in life without a plan. Without mm. a plan, you plan to fail. That's good. That's you know? good. So that's what you know. That's what really comes out uh, with me when it comes to with the finances and with doing everything else is just plan it out. Plan it out. Write it down. Do it. Okay. So what I like to do is um, I like to blow up this balloon. And then I'm going to allow you to write one word or one phrase on the balloon that you believe prevents people from acting on their dreams. And what we're going to do after you write that is we're going to pop it because we want to take the air out of anything negative that people could have. So I'm going to let you think on that as I blow this up. Here's a marker for you. So, fear of what others think can often prevent you from acting on your dreams. But today, we're going to take the air out of that. Okay? So tell the people where they can find you. Tell them about the program when it starts, where they can find you on IG, everything. You can find me on Instagram, 
uh, Rashid Walker for. Uh, that's my personal page. You can find the Nashville Pro-Am page, npblhoops.com. That's the website. Then you can, on Instagram, you can find it at, it, at the same thing, NPBL Hoops. And 622 Customs, it is what it is. Um, on LinkedIn, Rashi Walker, uh, Facebook, Jose Hustle, uh, and Nashville. Just look up in the sky, you'll see me, because that's where I'm going. Oh. <laughs> I'm going up and yeah. out. Appreciate it, man. <laughs>